Ventricular systole and pulseless electrical activity are two types of cardiac arrest, meaning the heart has stopped. In both of these, a patient doesn't have a pulse, meaning that they're not pumping blood to the rest of the body. And that's why both of these conditions are absolutely fatal unless they're corrected immediately. So in ventricular asystole, there's no electrical activity in the heart. If there's no electrical activity, that means that the ventricle walls aren't contracting. And that's what asystole basically means. A means no, and systole implies ventricular contractions. So no ventricular contractions. Again, no electrical activity means no ventricular contractions, means no cardiac output, or in other words, there's no blood flowing to the rest of the body. So there's no cardiac output. And without cardiac output, you're not gonna have a pulse. So anybody who has ventricular systole will not have a pulse. And on EKG, this looks like a flat line because there's no electrical activity to cause any movement on EKG. And this is a flat line that you hear about on movies and TV shows when they say, the patient's flatlining, it's asystole. And then there's pulseless electrical activity. And this is known as PEA. In PEA, there is electrical activity on EKG. However, it doesn't result in a pulse. And the electrical activity you see on EKG could be something that normally produces a pulse, such as normal sinus rhythm, or even heart block, or sinus bradycardia. But for some reason, there's not a pulse. Now, how could this be? Well, in a normal heart, the heart's electrical activity causes the muscle cells to contract. So you have action potentials that propagate or run through the heart and they'll lead to muscle contraction. And this relationship between electrical activity and mechanical contraction is called electromechanical coupling. However, when the heart is under extreme stress, so say the heart's been deprived of oxygen for a long time, this system gets disconnected. So even though there's electrical activity, it's not gonna lead to contractions because we've disconnected the system, and this is called electromechanical uncoupling. So despite the fact that cells can undergo and propagate action potentials, the action potentials don't result in muscle contraction. Another reason why you could have electrical activity without a pulse is because there could be something blocking the heart. Now the heart has a sac outlining it called the pericardium. And in some cases, this might be full of blood, and if it is full of blood, it's gonna press down on the heart and the heart's not gonna have any room to pump. This is called tamponade or cardiac tamponade. And again, this is a condition where the heart is constricted by this fluid filled sac around the heart and the heart can't pump. So even though you can have action potentials and electroactivity in the heart, you're not gonna be able to pump and you won't have a pulse. Okay, so I'm sure you've seen in movies or TV shows where someone flatlines or has a systole and someone else comes running into the room, puts paddles on the chest and yells, clear! In this case, they're defibrillating the patient, meaning they're providing electrical shocks to the heart to hopefully convert the heart back into a normal rhythm. However, this is a common misconception. We never shock a systole or PEA for that matter. Defibrillation only works on very specific abnormal cardiac rhythms that can potentially be reversed with an electric shock. And these are called shockable rhythms. Shockable rhythms include ventricular fibrillation, where the walls of the ventricles are spasming and therefore they can't contract and you're not gonna circulate blood to the rest of the body, and pulseless ventricular tachycardia, meaning that there's some sort of abnormal conduction in the ventricles that cause the ventricles to pump at a dangerously high rate. So neither of these has a pulse. And just a side note, we never shock anyone with a pulse. Something else to note is that even though ventricular fibrillation and pulseless VTAC meet the criteria for PEA and that there's electrical activity, but no pulse, we don't typically classify them as PEA. These two arrhythmias are in a class of their own because we treat them differently. They're shockable rhythms. PEA is considered electroactivity without a pulse that's not V-fib or pulseless VTAC. Now, how do we treat asystole and PEA? 
A systole and PEA are considered non-shockable rhythms, meaning providing a shock won't likely restore a normal rhythm. How do we treat non-shockable rhythms? We start with cardiopulmonary resuscitation, or CPR, where we alternate chest compressions with some sort of artificial breathing for the patient, whether that be mouth-to-mouth or doing oxygen through some sort of mask. We'll also administer vasoconstrictive medications. Now, vasoconstrictive means that we're constricting the vasos or the vessels. So these drugs constrict the blood vessels. And equally important with any patient who's pulseless, we have to consider any factors that could be reversed that might be contributing to the cardiac arrest. And you can remember which factors to consider by the mnemonic H's and T's, which we're gonna go over in just one second. So what are the H's and T's? Remember, they're potentially reversible conditions that could be causing or even contributing to the cardiac arrest. So if any patient in cardiac arrest has any of these factors, we want to try to reverse it or fix it to help save them. Now, something to know is that a lot of these H's and T's are conditions where there's some sort of lack of adequate blood circulating to the body or adequate oxygen delivery to the body, including the heart. Heart cells need oxygen to function properly. So if there's not enough oxygen getting to the heart, then the heart cells aren't happy and they quit working properly. The first H we're gonna talk about is hypovolemia. So hypo means low and volemia refers to volume. So this basically means low blood volume, usually from excessive bleeding. In hypovolemia, not enough blood is circulating, so not enough oxygen is getting around. The next H is hypoxia. And that means that there's inadequate oxygen supply to the body. And hypoxia can be due to many things, such as drowning or even a heart attack. So there's inadequate oxygen getting to the body, to the heart, and to the brain. The next H is hydrogen ions. And hydrogen ions basically means acidosis meaning that the body's pH is too low. And acidosis often results from long periods of hypoxia. We also need to consider the person's potassium level because hypo and hyperkalemia can lead to cardiac arrest. Now hypokalemia means that there's too low potassium and hyperkalemia means the potassium level is too high. Potassium plays a really important role in maintaining normal electrical conduction in the heart. So you can imagine that if the levels are too high or too low, this will disrupt the heart's electrical conduction system. And anyone in cardiac arrest that comes in, we're gonna check their glucose level because hypoglycemia or low blood glucose can lead to cardiac arrest. And this is something that's easily fixed. And the last H we're gonna talk about is hypothermia or low body temperature. And typically we think of hypothermia as a temperature less than 95 degrees Fahrenheit or 35 degrees Celsius. So as a person's core temperature drops, the heart's pacemaker cells fire less and less, and eventually the heart can stop. Okay, so those are the H's. Now let's move on to the T's. We need to consider toxins, and toxins include both prescription medications and street drugs. If someone comes in because of cardiac arrest due to a toxin, there might be a reversal agent that will help reverse the effects of the toxin and could help save the patient. The second T is tamponade, and that's something we just talked about. And we're referring to cardiac tamponade. Like we said, this is a condition where blood fills the space that lines the heart or the pericardial sac. And this constricts the heart and makes it a lot harder for the heart to pump. And sometimes the heart can't even pump at all. And if the heart's not pumping, no blood circulating. And one way I like to think about it is to think about doing a jumping jack. Now imagine doing that jumping jack underwater. It's a lot harder to do a jumping jack underwater because all this pressure is around your arms and legs. Likewise, it's harder for the heart to pump with all the added pressure surrounding it. And the next T is something called tension pneumothorax. So in the chest wall, the lungs are surrounded by a pleural lining. So there's a space created called the pleural space between the lungs and the chest wall. In a tension pneumothorax, air can somehow enter this pleural space. And this is usually because of some sort of trauma to the chest. And what happens is air enters this pleural space, but it can't leave. 
And as more and more air enters the space, it crushes the lung and even pushes the lung and the heart to the side. A crushed or collapsed lung is not going to be able to move oxygen very easily and the heart can stop. And the last T we're going to talk about is thrombosis, basically meaning blood clot. In the case of cardiac arrest, we're concerned about a blood clot to a coronary artery or an artery that supplies the heart with oxygenated blood, or we're concerned about a clot in the lungs, and that's known as a pulmonary embolism. So a pulmonary embolism is a clot in the lung. So clots in either the heart or the lungs can lead to severe oxygen depletion and eventually lead to cardiac arrest.